Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Atomic Podcast. Thank you for joining, for listening, and really being part of what I think is, is in essence, a movement. And that this movement in terms of thinking and action and building of new technologies, and also how they impact our personal lives, uh, our professional lives, and also society at large. And we've seen a, a number of different uh, thinkers, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, really scholars in different areas from quantum to AGI to AI and uh, to consciousness. And so today I'm super happy to be um, talking with uh, Jeffrey Shaw. And Jeffrey wrote a book that really prompted me to reach out to him. It's called Delusions of Freedom. And I know we're going to be talking about it. Uh, it was written about 10 years ago. I'll let Jeff give background and uh, into the book and to himself. Um, but it, for me, it was one of the only analyses I ever saw between ideas of, of, of consciousness, spirituality, state, and technology, uh, and the church, and really how all of those really came together in his book. And he actually analyzed them, I, I think, in a, in a wonderful way. And so um, super excited. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Rodney, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's been 10 years. It's hard to believe since uh, Illusions of Freedom was published by Whip and Stock. Uh, and, you know, over those 10 years, obviously, there have been uh, a number of technological advances even since then. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, the book, while it focuses on two individuals, uh, Thomas Merton and Jacques Ellul, it ends up bringing in an awful lot more than just the thoughts of two men. Um, church, state, politics, economics, advertisement, education, a whole host of what some people today might think, oh, wow, even just that one issue is a hot button issue in today's political discourse. So it just happened to fall out that a number of different interesting ideas came from the book. Uh, and, 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 Jeff, that, and Jeff, can yes, I just please. jump in a second on you? I just want to ask yes. you, because this is really uh, interesting. What was your impulse and intuition to write that book? Like what got you going that didn't get anyone else going? Yeah, that's, that's wow. I've grappled with that question quite a few times since, it, since I wrote the book. It began its life as a dissertation in a PhD program, the, the general idea. Uh, and my professors at the time at Salve Regina University, a, a small Catholic liberal arts school in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, I, I mentioned that I was thinking about uh, including Jacques Ellul in my dissertation. And the first thought was, well, that, that's, he's not a systematic thinker. You know, it, it would be difficult to get a hold of what he's really trying to say. You know, you can cite him here and there in support of some other argument, but I wouldn't focus too much on just him. So I, that kind of made me think, well, now I really am going to focus on him because I want to try and systematize something that's not systematized. So another professor said, well, why don't you take another individual and kind of juxtapose their thinking? I said, well, how about Thomas Merton? And the response was, oh, he's even less <laughs> systematic. That would be impossible to try and take two such amorphous sets of ideas and be able to put them up against each other in any organized fashion. So I would not recommend that. So that drove me even further to wanting to do it. So it did work. It worked by taking other thinkers from the 20th century and using them as uh, signposts, so to speak, or, or maybe even like tent poles. And so that way you could take the unsystematized thought of a Merton and an Alul and give it some guidance, even though both Merton and Alul might say, you know, that that's not where I went when wanted to go. I wouldn't have necessarily gone there, but by writing what they did, and presenting their information and their thoughts in the manner that they did, they really opened themselves up, and I think they would agree, to being reviewed, examined, and studied in the way that I did. So hopefully they would. Of course, neither one is still with us. But um, that's where it came from. Um, and then, of course, the dissertation, I defended that in 2012, gosh, 12 years ago. 
Uh, and then the then the book is is a much more in depth, enhanced look at those two thinkers. So that's where it came from, and that's where it is today. And as we've discussed, I'm thinking about maybe pushing it along further because there's so much more that you could talk about. Uh, in, so let's in, talk about quickly though the. Yeah. Uh, the, the sort of foundation uh, coming out of academia as dissertation, you know, as being discouraged, that encouraged. <laughs> yeah. I think those are all really great points. I'm also really interested in how both thinkers and how you come into both thinkers understanding concern, analysis of technology and technique. Sure. And if you could sort of kind of uh, describe kind of maybe Merton's point of view and uh, Alul's point of view, I think that would be s super great. So Rodney, if I may, well, I'll start with Alul. Okay. Uh, because And the reason is because of what you just said, technology and technique, which is always, always the way that uh, thinkers in, in, in this country and in the, in the English speaking world approach those two words. And that's the the challenge when you're reading anything by Jacques Ellul, because in the French, technique has a different connotation. And Ellul, the entire foundation for his thoughts about the human condition rest on this idea of technique. Now to you or me or to anyone listening to this, they might think, oh, like, like a technique for baking bread or a technique for changing oil. You have a list and that's your technique, but that's not what that word is to a lull or in French per se. Uh, technique as a lull uses it is, and I'm gonna try to quote him, it's the totality of methods rationally arrived at that have the absolute efficiency in every human endeavor. So it's a totality of methods that are arrived at through the rational process that drive forward every facet of society and every field of human activity, medicine, art, literature, philosophy itself, even religion, language, everything has this set of rational principles which become more and more efficient and technique autonomously seeks the most efficient way of doing every single thing that human beings do. In a nutshell, that is what technique is to Jacques Ellul. Now, there are plenty of Ellul scholars who would add to that or maybe say, oh, yeah, that's a that's a B-plus answer. But in a nutshell, that's what it is. And, and it's different from technology because that to us, you know, when I hear technology or when most people hear it, they probably think of a cell phone or a computer or some thing, right? Some device. It's a, it's a high tech device. But in, in my book, and I think to Alul and to Merton, and this is why they're juxtaposed one to the other in the book, technology is a process. It's the process of using rational thought and efficiency to achieve certain things in society or in civilization. So in my book, I use a definition from Carl Mitchum, a, a rather well-known thinker and philosopher, uh, who stated that, uh, that technology is a relatively unthinking process that results in the creation of tools uh, and so his, pro his definition takes into account both the process and the product. So that was the definition I wanted to pin down. Uh, so that's Jacques Ellul. If I may, let me, I'll just give a little brief bio of Ellul so that people that have never heard of him will know a little bit about him. Uh, born in 1912 in Bordeaux, France. So just before the First World War. Of course, he wouldn't have remembered it, maybe the end of it. Uh, but he was born in 1912, lived pretty much his whole life in that area, in France. Um, 
Importantly, I think for both Alul and Merton, they were raised in, in rural environments. So they were immersed in nature in a rather unfettered way. You know, not like he didn't have helicopter parents or, you know, whatever term we use to, you know, he climbed trees. He, he played around on the docks. You know, he wouldn't really do that. He shouldn't have done it then, probably shouldn't do it now. But that's what he did. He, he had what we would consider uh, a free reign uh, in his youth. Uh, and of course, then, you know, various events shaped his outlook. Uh, things that to us might seem like, oh, that I've never even heard of that. But the Spanish Civil War. You know, 1936 to 1939, that great clash of right-wing, left-wing philosophy in Spain. Uh, of course, the, the fascists win that conflict. Then, of course, the Second World War. Alul is, is part of the resistance, the French resistance, in a passive manner. He's not engaged in, in combat activity, but he was in the resistance. Uh, and then, of course, the Cold War. You know, the, the brink of potential nuclear Armageddon throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s, really, and maybe even still today, but it's not the Cold War. Uh, the, the protest movements in France, 1968, Alul, he's right there. Now, he's not in Paris. He, he's not a Parisian thinker. You know, in, in Fr he's not a Catholic. So he's on the fringes of the French intelligentsia. And he still is, even in, you know, the late Jacques Ellul, has not really achieved that level of, uh, you know, Marcuse or Foucault. His name isn't on that pedestal. Uh, but he's enjoying a little bit of a resurgence because of this idea of, of technique and the march of efficiency, especially as, uh, you know, he died in 1994. Uh, obviously, from then until now, you know, that's, that's 30 years ago, enormous change has given his viewpoint some additional uh, credibility. Uh, he wasn't seeking that. And as I mentioned, he, he didn't present his thinking in a system. There's no system. He's not presenting an orthodoxy. He's just thinking. He's thinking about things and he's engaging in the dialectical process, which is not de rigueur today. You know, pundits aren't dialectics. You know, I think this, therefore it's right. That's not the dialectical process and that's not how Alul presented his thinking. Uh, Alul gave us two tracks of thought, a sociological, which is the one for which he's known, uh, the technological society being his, his opus, um, but he has an entire separate track of, of Christian writing um, that's much less known. But you can't understand a little without both, because with the, within that Christian track, that's that's the hope, because his sociological writing is not beach reading. It's not oh, it was a bright sunny day. I'm going to read a little. You wouldn't do that <laughs> because you're gonna you're just gonna end up depressed after you're done reading. Uh, so you have to take it in whole. It's a dialectic. He's not trying to answer any questions. He's not trying to seek eternal truths. He's dealing with irreconcilable ideas and leaving them irreconciled. He's grasping, essentially, as he would say, the whole of reality and dealing with it and presenting different ways of thinking about what are essentially the biggest questions that we face in any realm. Uh, and that's his work. That, that's how he did it. He never corresponded with Thomas Merton and probably never heard of Thomas Merton. It, it, it's unlikely he knew who Thomas Merton was. Now, uh, Thomas Merton is a little more well-known um, within the United States and, and internationally, a uh, Catholic monk, He's, he's 1915 to 1968. He died much younger. Um, and there is a, a robust and uh, vibrant Merton society. Uh, but again, Merton is not presenting a field of, of thought. An ortho, there's no Merton orthodoxy. There's no 
True Believers or Merton T-shirts. You don't have, you know, Che Guevara T-shirt, Thomas Merton T-shirt. No, you don't have that. Merton is presenting also a type of a dialectical approach. Uh, obviously, it's more in the theological realm, but Merton did read Jacques Ellul's Technological Society. So he knew about Ellul, and he uh, found Ellul's thought to be exceptionally compelling. Uh, had Merton lived longer, perhaps they might have met. Uh, but Ellul's greatest work was published in this country in 1964. That's when it was translated and published in the United States. And Merton died four years later. So uh, that's the end of that story as far as those two are concerned. But what I found most compelling in, with both of these thinkers is that they are thinking about thinking. They're anti-pundits. They're constantly open to new ways of thinking about what they've already even said. In fact, Alul would occasionally totally contradict something they had recently written. So yeah, on further thought, Maybe it's better to think of it this way. Uh, Merton was in a constant thought vector that is hard to trace. Uh, but he, you know, he was Roman Catholic, although uh, very welcome and open to thinking deeply outside of the Catholic tradition. He was very close friends with the Dalai Lama, uh, had many Protestant friends, Hindu, Buddhist. Uh, so he was a, a true... Uh, universal thinker. So to take these two and put them together in one book uh, was challenging. But again, by taking three other individuals, that gave me three chapters and three uh, fundamental uh, compartments, so to speak, to put them in and see how they came out. That was you know, the gist of it. You know, one of the things that uh, strike me about Merton in particular is that as a as a contemplative as someone that is um, maybe perceived as retreating into the monastery or being far more private which he was and often writing when when being private um, he was also super engaged in the world and very deeply involved in anything from like you said you know nuclear war to kind of uh, you know social movements uh, the concern with basically the way in which not just our spiritual world as individuals operate, which he was very focused on, but also how our individual world and from a spiritual sense gets derailed through technological means or gets mitigated in some way. So the idea that we could uh, and the church itself could in fact um, get off the rails, whatever the rails mean. He was involved in all of those dis different discussions where technology comes in a, a huge play. And I think, you know, what is your thoughts on Alul and Merton and this way of thinking about thinking, but also this way of thinking about thinking as it applies to both, you know, uh, organized religion, spirituality, and this incredible explosion of technology? I mean, how sure. do we, because I, technique, I, I see. Merton, I see, but a lot of people don't see how Merton plays into that larger matrix. And it's a, a tricky way to try and thread him into it. But as you just said, the, the, the church, right, the, the organized church, the hierarchical church, uh, you know, Alul was a French Reformed church Protestant, um, obviously not the dominant religion in France. Right. Uh, he wasn't a Roman Catholic. Uh, Merton is a Roman Catholic. He became one. He, he wasn't born into any kind of organized religious faith, uh, but he became one as a young man. Um, and I think, you know, in the so Merton enters the monastery right before Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> uh, not to escape. <laughs> he didn't know Pearl Harbor. You know, he didn't know it was going to happen, but he, he entered the monastery. And so he's there and he sees you know, he's not writing and engaging from day one. He did spend a great deal of time strictly doing the monk thing, right? He's, he's, he's not making chartreuse, but he's contemplating. He's in doing that thing as the monks do for quite some time. Uh, then he writes his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, which is an international bestseller. Uh, and then he, with the permission of his abbot at various times, is able to 
come out, so to speak, of his, his snail shell. And he engages deeply with uh, literati, with uh, authors um, in Poland, he engaging with Albert Camus. He's reading Hemingway, you know, not on the list of uh, Trappist monk reading, but he's engaging deeply because the stakes are so high. As you mentioned, you know, these are these were uh, tough times. Not that we don't have tough times today, uh, but the 50s, the 60s, when the, when both Alul and Merton are sort of at their peak of their thought and their writing, um, they're looking at the church, whether, you know, in Merton's case, the Catholic church hierarchy, its tendency towards compromising with, with the political element of the state, uh, employing technology in various ways. And, and, and again, it's important, I think, to note that neither Merton nor Alul is saying, well, it's bad that technology is doing this or that. They're just shining a flashlight on it, saying, hey, maybe we should think about what is it that might result from these various uses of technology. Uh, but they both were quite critical of the unquestioned acceptance of both the technological process as well as some of the products of technology uh, as it applied to the church. Uh, and I think an important note, you know, I, my book is called Illusions of Freedom. Uh, so I had to define technology and I did, yeah, I used Carl Mitchum. And then the, the idea of freedom, you know, okay, well, what does that mean? So in this particular book, and in this case, to argue uh, with Merton and Alul, their particular view of freedom is a little different than the, the average person uh, reading a book or out on the street. And their, their view of freedom is that it's one's freedom to accept the word of God and live the Christian life. That's their view. Uh, in writing the book, I wasn't writing it because I also have that view. I'm not saying I do or don't. I just wanted to put out there that that's their view. And so, of course, they're going to be looking at how does, is the church facilitating that particular uh, attainment of that gift of freedom as they understand it? Or is technique, you know, is this pursuit of efficiency in every endeavor, is rational thought, is technology hindering the church from achieving its stated objective of helping individuals uh, live the Christian life? And they both would say they're not doing their proper role. And they're pointing the finger at the hierarchy of the church um, <clears throat> the physical uh, bureaucracy of the church, that sort of thing. They're not wagging their finger at individual believers or church goers. Uh, they're basically including the church bureaucracy in with the state, the military, the economy, all of those entities within society that are beholden to technique and are pursuing that rational efficiency. Uh, Alul had a great, great quote. Um, he said that civilization is on a quest of continually improved means to casually and carelessly examined ends. So when you try to get that in a nutshell, he doesn't give specific examples. You know, he doesn't say, oh, the tape recorder is, you know, he's not doing that. It's making general statements, but I, I can't help, you know, I see a commercial for a driverless car. Like, come on, well, that's, why is that? Do we need that? Is that a perfect example of carefully considered means to carelessly considered ends? Maybe so. Uh, but even the church itself in, in Merton's thought and in Alul's thought is on that quest of carefully considered means, rational means, efficient means, but to what end? To what goal are they trying to achieve through employing these methods? Where is it taking them? And neither Merton nor Alul was optimistic that the church as a human entity, as an entity within society 
was free from the constraints of technique. So that that was really where I fell out with that one. And it seemed that uh, Alul actually thought the church enabled technique. He would go that far. He did. He did. And I think Merton might have been close behind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, Alul, after the Second World War, of course, on the on the French left, uh, which Alul would certainly have been considered on the left side of the political spectrum. You know, if you look at the French resistance, it's predominantly those on the left side of the political aisle. You know, I, I once heard someone say, well, the political right were drinking wine in Vichy with the Germans. OK, that's a little harsh, but predominantly communists and socialists are going to be in the resistance. Of course, there are also uh, French nationalists in the resistance, too. Uh, but there was this vision among the resistors that there would be a renewed society. You know, you throw off the German yoke and French society would be start, start anew, where the old sins of the past could be just cleansed by virtue of liberating Paris and driving the German army out. Of course, that, that was a military accomplishment, not a philosophical one, but that didn't happen, of course. That, that's not how it went. So Elul goes into a uh, disappointment, to, to put it lightly, uh, as did many of the French uh, intelligentsia, the left, the left wing uh, intellectuals, who were not as pleased. You know, Charles de Gaulle is back as president of France. They went through the, the, the terror of the Algerian crisis in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, the French version of Vietnam in you know, 1954 with the Ambien Phu. So France is back as, as old France. You know, it's an empire. It's doing the things old France did. And it's not where they envisioned it. So they're accusatory. They're accusing the church. Like, hey, the church, you should be a tool of renewal. But you're in cahoots. <laughs> you're right back. You know, Voltaire already did part one of this story. We've got to do part two now. So, of course, Alul was not in a good place uh, in that post-war era. And he was quite critical uh, of the, he's pointing his finger at the general church, not the French Reformed Church only, uh, but the entire Christian edifice within France, within France. Merton's view is... Um, go ahead, Rodney. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I want you to, to finish your thought. I'm sorry. I'll have yeah. To... So, so Merton's view is going to be more um, uh, as the, as it goes into the '60s. Um, this might, you know, a Merton scholar might jump in and say, "No, no, you're off track." But I'm going to just say that I think uh, as Merton became more familiar with with Buddhism, and and again, Buddhism, you know, it's not an an institutional church. You know, the Dalai Lama is not the Pope. Uh, but as, as Merton experienced other ways of uh, expressing spirituality, uh, I think he became a little bit more frustrated with the calcified, to use a term that I don't think he specifically used, but the calcified nature of the hierarchy of the church in which he was a part, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so different reasons for both Merton and Alul to take the view that they did about the church writ large, uh, but they expressed it in a similar manner and they attributed the role of technique and technology uh, in a similar way. You know, one of the things that both these figures and there are other figures as well, but these uh, figures did maybe by design or by accident is they stepped out of the church, both conceptually physically into areas in which technology and technique were core, um, whether it was a nuclear bomb or anything else. And so this idea that the church was all embracing uh, of their experience would not be true. They somehow were able to break those silos and to become a different kind of, of thinker, maybe mystic, you know, whatever you want to put the labels on. And I think that is very, very needed today, um, particularly in our moment. Um, did you see, um, like I think of Merton's 
notion of false self. He was much more focused on the individual and, and self and how that gets corrupted in certain ways, uh, both generally by ourselves, <laughs> you know, by our own sort of problems and, and uh, deceptions. But he was very focused on, on, a, on a certain kind of being. And Alul was, a, a, from my perspective, was really focused on a certain kind of structure and uh, society that we could live in that would actually enable what you were saying, that kind of freedom. Um, and, and yet those are, those are really key to the way we operate today or should operate today. They're really key to us understanding our technological technique based world. And yet we don't have religious, uh, well, I'll just say, say really spiritual leaders that really cross those areas enough. And is that also kind of an impulse that you saw early or did that sort of impulse to see these thinkers become worldly, uh, something that came out of the book? So they definitely, as you said, went out of their silo, right? They they went out of their uh, their field. More so for Merton because he's a monk who has taken a vow of silence. So for him to even write something for general publication was a big step. It's a little easier for Alul because he's not a man of the cloth. Uh, he is a professor. So it would be more natural for him to make those transitions and to tread that ground, so to speak. Uh, but for Merton, it's a, it's a radical break. And, you know, I think if you talk to some, well, you wouldn't talk to a lot of monks because they've taken a vow of silence. But, you know, he went so far outside of that paradigm. Um, and we're all better for it because of what he was able to do and write, you know, his last uh, he, he went to Thailand, he got on a jet, flew across the Pacific Ocean to Bangkok, Thailand for a conference. Of course, he, he sadly died there by accidental electrocution. But that's not something that monks were doing. Not American monks, Buddhist monks. Okay, different. Uh, he had already traveled to Ceylon. He had been to India. Uh, so he was the worldly monk. Um and I think it's it's emblematic of a of a, a process that, as I agree 100 percent, what you just said, we could all use a little bit of this, and not just from the spiritual perspective. You know, it's, it's the nature of spirituality today is is so much different than it was uh, for both Merton and Alul. Um, it's just the nature of the way it is now, uh, but. The idea of, of going outside of uh, your, your tribe, for example. You know, Merton was a, a monk who was devoted to contemplation, yet he had permission to write, to communicate by letter, you know, no, no email, obviously, or texting. He's writing, and just even think of that. You know, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to write a long letter to Czeslaw Milos in Poland. And um, it's going to be a long, and you know, a lot of the writing that we, a, a lot of Merton books are books of his letters to whoever they might have been to. Um, and they're long. And they have a, a month or so he gets a response. So, you know, in that month, maybe he thought, oh, gosh, I wonder if I should have said that or if I should have maybe said this. So the, I, the, the way of thinking, you know, it's not. Oh, I got a text from him. I'll send him a monkey emoji. Oh, I just got a light bulb. It's not that. It's not that. It's a totally different kind of thought that I don't know. You know, you wrote letters. I wrote letters. Even my daughters wrote letters. They don't really now. Nobody really does now. I don't think I've written a letter and put it in a mailbox in years. But when you do that, or when you did that, it was a different kind of thought. It required you to think about things as you wrote them down. And then maybe you didn't know exactly what you're gonna write, but you thought, you did the act of thinking. And then you're gonna travel halfway around the world and give a talk. You're not gonna send anyone PowerPoint. You're gonna just go there and talk. And that's what Merton did uh, in his last, conference in, in Bangkok. And that just requires a different way of being in the world. 
And we can think all we want about Alul and Merton and other individuals. But can we do that? And does it matter that they did it? What can we gain just from thinking about what they did? And can we take any of that? And, you know, I'm not thinking that anyone that watches this is going to go write a letter <laughs> or do that. But just the way of thinking, the way of situating yourself and your opinions and your viewpoints and your worldview. And as you're thinking about it, maybe re-examining it. So Merton and Alul did that frequently, frequently. You know, Merton was involved in conversations with people like Aldous Huxley, um, the Dalai Lama, many other individuals that you might not think, you know, today they would be so far apart and, and so fossilized into the political spectrum that you would never have a discussion between them unless it was a some kind of a jab, you know, like like you see all the time today. So the ability to consider other people's opinions, not necessarily change your own opinions, but examine your own thoughts within the context of the opinions of others and think about it from that perspective. I think that's what Merton and Alul did really well. Not just them. They're not the only ones who have done it. Uh, but even at the end of their writing life, the end of their correspondence, neither one of them came up and said, well, I told you I, I was right. That's just, that wasn't their objective. That wasn't their goal. They weren't looking for true believers or presenting an orthodoxy. Uh, but by going outside of their faith tradition, you know, is, is, is a symbol to us that, well, what if we just stepped outside of our comfort zone in any regard, political, economic, social, whatever, for just a brief moment, even thought about some perspective from some other way of thinking, not to change your mind, but just to broaden your own way of thinking about various topics. That's what I found most interesting about both of these people. Yeah, I, I, I so I so agree with you um, about that, and and uh, I really appreciate both of them for this. I'm I'm really interested in kind of the lessons that you've taken from them reaching beyond the silos and how you see that as maybe um, a different level of creativity and you know community or, or mutuality that you're describing in academia or through academia or outside of academia, because, you know, the humanities itself, um, as well as a lot of other disciplines are kind of micro siloed in different ways. And yet these thinkers kind of stand above that and say, you know, you need to be urgently communicative, by the way, they weren't looking for fame. Right. You know, yeah, they, weren't. they weren't looking to get some likes or anything like that, you know, they really kind of urgently had questions. So they wrote to the people they thought that they could help them answer some of those questions. And that's not only healthy, I think it's just remarkable. And um, I just want to get a sense of your, your take on them as a model for how the humanities and how perhaps you are negotiating or could negotiate you know, the humanities differently. So I do teach at Salve Regina as, as an adjunct professor in the PhD program. Pure humanities. It's pure human. It's pure, you know, Joseph Piper liberal arts. Mm -hmm. Pure liberal arts, um, and it's wonderful. It is as a humanities program, though. You know, it does. Um, we use a text uh, by C.P. Snow, the two cultures, the lecture he gave. You know, the oh, the sciences and the humanities can no longer communicate. Um, and I think there's still some, you know relevance to that but really you know now it's maybe the 20 cultures and all those cultures are in the humanities it's be it's like looking through a shattered pane of glass so, whereas before even in merton and alul's time you didn't quite have that yeah there might have been some dust on the glass maybe some smudges but it was uh, intact for the most part now it's not so much intact uh but i know for the program at, that i teach at uh, teach in at salve regina uh it gives me the absolute greatest optimism 
for the humanities. The students are wonderful. They do take an approach that I think Alul and Merton would welcome them into their uh, conviviality. Uh, welcome to our, you know, our lecture tonight. Uh, so the, I'm happy about that. I teach at some other schools, um, not in a pure humanities realm. So I'll specifically just talk about this one. Um, you know, some of the students that I'm working with are looking at Rene Girard or um, you know, Soren Kierkegaard, not household names. Uh, but again, as the humanities, as the liberal arts, it's thinking about thinking. And in doing so, you know, very few of the students are there uh, to fill a square. Yeah, they may have benefit from getting the degree and more power to them if they do. Uh, but they have other motives. And a lot of those motives are the classical, you know, they'd be in Plato's Academy, welcomed right in the door. Uh, so I'm very happy about that. And I do, uh, I think that this method that Alul and Merton provide um, whether it's a pure dialectic where you know you're not going to answer the question, but you're going to consider the extremes of opinions within that particular set of ideas, and you're going to be comfortable doing so. That's a real strength for people that is somewhat lost. I say lost, but I'm not sure it was there was ever a heyday when people were walking around putting their arm around each other. Hey, I understand, you know, you're a communist and I'm a capitalist. It's okay. I don't think we were really ever at that point. Uh, but I think things aren't so bad. Uh, I think they're pretty good. And I think, um, you know, I, I encounter students that, oh, yeah, I, I've read some of Lowell and uh, here's what I think. And you have a discussion and, uh, you know, Merton may be a little more familiar. Uh, but this way of thinking, this way of being in the world um, might not be in such peril as we sometimes think. Uh, I'm hopeful that that's the case. I'm hopeful that it is. Yeah, I, I'm so appreciate your, your hopefulness um, and also your contribution to bringing that hope to, to your students. I think figures like you wrote about, uh, Merton and Alul, and also the the lessons that you've drawn and I'm, other people are drawn from such work is really important to not just think about thinking, that's really important too, but to really create kind of different people in the world that, yeah. Yeah. you know, that whatever the profession they go into, they keep this alive in them, the silo breaking, they keep the, you know, the, this field needs to extend into this area, you know, that's sort of more yeah. worldly aspect of whether they're, you know, a chemist or, um, you know, a machine learning engineer, that what they've been socialized and taught is one version of what's much larger for them to connect to. And I think that this, that's really important. And um, I, I think, we're talking about the humanities, but we could be talking about other aspects of education, um, sure. you know, that gets highly specialized. So it, it's just super interesting to me that you you found these two thinkers that I actually think are far more relevant today than they were when you wrote about them. Um, from my perspective, you know, I'm a, I'm a, just a fan of, of of Merton. And I would say to some degree, he's almost saved my life in the way that he thinks about self and false self and you know being contemplative in a very very noisy world um yeah and that's that's a part of merton that uh i think so it, it it's outside the technology thinking but it but it isn't it, it actually is is it fits nicely in there it is in my book uh, and this is a place where you can take uh soren kierkegaard for example you know danish philosopher 19, early 19th century um his concept of leveling like you know tech to say technology in the context of 1820 okay it's different uh but it's manifest in different ways it still was present there and in some ways you could possibly argue that the impact of it was more extreme because if you you know you go back to 1620 15 14 Soren Kierkegaard's ancestors, his living ancestors, uh, you know, his grandparents maybe, 
they had more in common with even the Romans technologically than than we have with Kierkegaard. So, you know, the, the radical nature of the change of pace in technology at that time, but this idea of leveling, like at this, these new ideas and the assumptions and ways of seeking efficiency are leveling all people into the herd. You know, you're all the herd now. Uh, you've lost the ability to think about things and, and the church and spirituality, and it's only going to get worse as these progressions continue this leveling force will be stronger and merton really latched onto that as did a little they both pointed to that um, and i think the false self merton's idea of the false self is a key part of his writing and how would he have known about this phenomena without experiencing people in society without going outside of the monastery. You have to go see the people to know about this and, and different cultures. And I think he would have concluded that, yeah, all people are subject to this kind of adoption of a false identity that's sold to you through advertisements. And that, that was a big thing in the 50s and 60s. It was a rather new phenomenon. This advert, you know, mad men, that kind of thing. You adopt these ideas that are given to you without any thinking you just do it um, of course those forces are infinitely more powerful now with tailored advertisements i mean we're all just a marketing niche away from you know having ll beans permanently stamped on our forehead so but that false self notion is a real part of merton's thought and i and i've heard other people say you know this is this changed me uh, dr tremendously uh, reading about, you know, Merton was a regular guy. He was a regular beer drinking college kid, um, getting into trouble, listening to jazz records in the thirties, uh, troublesome. And then he becomes a monk and this insightful philosophical thinker. And so we can all kind of relate to that. Hey, I, I partied in college and, I kind of relate to what Merton is saying. So it's it's interesting to hear you say that. Yeah, I, I really strongly feel, um, and by the way, I'm sure you still party. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't get the party out of. Oh, no, uh, that's right. All right. But I do think that it, um, Merton was a regular guy and the two figures though do um, bring something up for me is as you mentioned, they both had a kind of rural kind of free background, meaning in terms of kids, they could run, but also creatively. I mean, particularly Merton, you know, um, being in a family of, of artists and kind of free thinkers, I think he always took on the idea that creativity was really important. It was a life force uh, and it was not to be dismissed. And so if you think about the church, being somewhat dismissive about creativity because really you're you're much more part of the sort of protocols of the church, particularly as a monk. Uh, I think that he was able to accommodate that, but he still remained a troublemaker because he had to push against that and uh, not just push against it to be a troublemaker, but transform it. And that's what he did, I think. Um, and I take that as a great lesson. You can be a troublemaker, but transform things along the way. Sure. The better, you know. And and I think in a nutshell, you could just say, you know, Merton transformed. He, he did. Um, he he uh, changed the nature of the way people thought about the, certain institutions. Uh, he, he deeply challenged various political positions taken by uh, presidents, whether Eisenhower or, or Kennedy or especially Johnson, as we went into the Vietnam era, of course, Merton. Uh, died during that, and ironically, his body was flown home in a B-52 bomber. Uh, not what he would have envisioned for himself or wanted, but that's just how it worked out. Um, and he he pressed things. He didn't just accept the you know he was in search of that true self, right? He wanted to uh, escape from the herd, uh, 
you know, Eugene Ionesco's Rhinoceros, a, a play that uh, captures that idea. You know, everyone else turns into Rhinoceros, but the, the protagonist doesn't. Yet he's the misfit because he stayed the same. Well, everyone else changed, and, and Merton's Reign and the Rhinoceros, a series of poems and short stories about that idea that you know, in order to to maintain your true self, you have to fight to get that back uh, because society is going to overlay things on you and you oftentimes don't know it or you choose to just accept it. Um, and he's not critical of those who don't seek out the true self. He doesn't jab at you. He's just offering a path. No one has to follow it. It's the same with the law. He says that, uh, you know, I'm offering you some ways of thinking about important things. But if you don't do it, you're not bad or wrong. And at the same time, neither Merton or, or Alul is saying, well, I'm right. And if you don't do these things, you're doing it wrong. Never do they say that. So I think that's important, too. Uh, and, and never in Illusions of Freedom do I say, well, this is the way to do it. It's just two individuals' ideas put up against each other for readers to consider. You could you read the book. Think, and that, that, that's just, I don't agree. Yeah, and I think, that's okay. I, think, I think that's fantastic. Not only just fantastic, I think it's really essential approach to not be prescriptive, dictatorial, to not push your ideas as you see, you know, obviously ideas almost have a velocity of, of a club today. Uh, yeah, particularly yeah, on the yeah. political side, I'm talking political mostly, but still. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's something in a little I just want to touch. It may bring us back to technology a little bit um, before we close, which is, you know, a little I read uh, recently. He talks about propaganda in relationship to technique and technology, yeah. and basically what I read out of that is that propaganda is doesn't exist unless technique exists that it's highly dependent for any kind of propaganda related messaging to go forward uh I and mean, without technique zero so did you see and did you kind of interpret that this tight relationship between propaganda and technique and technology absolutely absolutely um uh, both you know it so propaganda, I mean, gosh, it, there's no good connotation of the word, right? Hey, I wish I had some propaganda to read. You would never do that. Yet, it's not always false or it's not always a lie. I, I think a good definition, and I'm not sure if I who I could attribute this to, it's information designed to compel a certain action. Okay, it's you know, you look at, oh, there's a football game on. I've got to drink a beer. Why? Because you've seen a million commercials for it. That's propaganda. We think of Chinese Communist Party propaganda. Uh, but then again, the Voice of America was effective in helping to bring about the downfall of the Soviet Union. Would It's a type of propaganda, but is it is it false or a lie? We wouldn't think it was. So it's a topic that is difficult to get your head around uh but not for a lull he's gonna say straight out you know it depends on technique rational methods applied to it starting out with a goal and only the most efficient propaganda is going to help you get to that goal uh for a lull he would you know the schools you're conditioning human beings to live in the technical milieu so to speak you're you're conditioning people to shed away their God-given rights and freedoms so that they can become a, a, a plug in this technological machine. That, that's propaganda. You can only be, do that by being propagandized into accepting your role a, as a cog in, you know, you think of Pink Floyd or something like that. But that that's why, so propaganda and technique are hand in hand. I wouldn't say one and the same necessarily, but I suppose if you really uh tried to whittle down to the core of both ideas you might find uh near identical uh attributes to both 
uh, and Merton talked about it too. You know, television was a new thing. And so there's these advertisements um, and, you know, Merton didn't watch a ton of television in the monastery, but he was able to see some when he came out and went on his, his travels. Uh, and so, it, it, yeah, if you came away thinking propaganda and technique in a Lul's thought are similar, I would agree. I would say that a Lul would say, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. It really is dependent and it's not dependent on a, a device or a particular technology. This would be an example of the process, right? This is where those rational, efficient means are employed with the most visible manifestation on the end side. How can you have had the Third Reich? How? Without propaganda. Yeah, okay, well, it was through the radio. Yeah, but not just that. People were conditioned through their thoughts to support this regime and to follow this path. Yep, they could. They might have heard it on the radio, or they heard it in in town, or from their friends. Whatever the case, you know, Alul would have pointed to that as an example. You know, the Communist Party. He would point to capitalism. Why? Why is it that you know this having things, having replaced being? Why did that happen? Uh, you know, you're hungry, now you need a refrigerator. You got to go somewhere, now you need a car. And so advertisements and, and propaganda in a certain manifestation is going to sell you that thing. Uh, it's going to create needs. And it's a type of technological determinism, which sometimes uh, seems to have run its course. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you look around, again, I go back to that driverless car, why? Who, who said, I just need a driverless car to tow this bulldozer behind me? That doesn't make a lot of sense, yet there it is. And every conceivable form of efficiency and rationalization is being put to bear on this particular manifestation. So it, uh, it, it almost, I agree. I think Merton and Alul both uh, are perhaps more applicable their ideas are more relevant now than even when they were writing if you have um maybe a um uh an encouragement uh for the audience going forward um you know as we close here the what would that be that that sort of lesson that approach um, to thinking and to being and, and just being out in this particular world we're in, which is very AI driven, um, yeah. is uh, what what kind of advice could you give us and um, give the audience? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to just, oh, put down your cell phone and read a book. Mm, I would I would expose, uh, I would gain some exposure to Alul and Merton's ideas. If you do it on a Kindle or, you know, Google it on your phone, that's fine too. But, you know, these are two individuals that had a great deal to say about some important ideas. You might totally disagree, and that's fine, because some people do. But at least give it uh, some attention. Jacques Ellul, Thomas Merton, what was it that they said? And is there some way that I might be able to think more deeply about things if I were familiar with their thought. That would be my most basic proposition to anybody. I think it's an excellent proposition, Jeff. Um, and if people want to buy your book, where would they go? Uh, go to Amazon? It's there. Yep. The publisher is WIPF and Stock, W-I-P-F and Stock. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of doing a part two. Of course, it'll be purely speculative because neither Merton or Alul ever would have imagined AI, but it might be worth a, worth a try. I think I think it definitely would, Jeff. I uh, just you know from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you for you know offering your, your insights, but also being in conversation with me. And of course, I know our audience will greatly appreciate it. So thank you, and and onwards to more work, right? That's it. That's right. Got to do it. All right. I really Jeff. appreciate it, Rodney. Thanks so much for your time. Take good care. Bye-bye. You too.